Good morning again, and as I said, my name is Toby Schilling. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the chaplain at Samaritan Medical Center, but my wife and I have been worshiping here for about the last 42 years, and uh, so we're not at all unfamiliar. Reverend Van Wee, I'm sure, is, as I said again earlier, is enjoying his vacation. We also want to welcome our listening audience, those people who are viewing us by virtue of our electronic messaging system, our, our tapes and, and uh, our opportunities that we have to share our morning worship services with those who may not be able to join us in person this morning. Our thoughts and our prayers are with you and the welcome is just as personal and just as deep as to all of those who are here this morning. Will you join me as we sing our first song of gathering, O Come All Ye Faithful? We'll sing just verse 5. It's number 234, if you don't know the, the melody. But Fina will play it through for us. to praise God, who has done wonderful things among us. In Jesus Christ, God has shown us love, given life for our presence, and strength for all our days. Sing praise to God's name. Bow before God in prayer. Open your hearts to God's saving word. Arise and shine, for your light has come. We have greet you in Christ's name. This is an opportunity for you to rise and greet one another. Good morning. Yes. Good morning, honey. How are you this morning? Good, out of girl. Good morning. Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year. Well, good morning. And welcome. Happy New Year. Nice to see you this morning. Yes. Good morning. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I see you survived New Year's Eve. Yes, yes. we stayed at home. <laughs> we, had, we had three little girls at home this oh morning. Oh my goodness. Happy New Year. Yes. Good morning. Happy New Year. Good morning. Happy New Year.
Good morning and Happy New Year to everyone. We're so glad to see you here this morning. In our worship today, let us remember that the love of God for his people and for his church knows no limits. The psalmist talks of God's love reaching up to the heavens and his justice to the depth of the ocean. And yet he blesses us as individuals with the gifts of his spirit so that his church, his people, might be a light in this place to his glory. Let us pray. Father God, we bring our offering of worship and with it the service of our lives through this coming week. May we go from this place knowing that we have met with you and been blessed by your spirit to live and work to your glory. We pray for confidence to share your word with others and for the opportunity to proclaim it. Forgive, Forgive our, our reluctance, our timidity. our timidity. We pray for wisdom to know what should be said and the moment in which to say it. Forgive, Forgive our, our reticence, our anxiety. anxiety. We pray for knowledge of the fullness of your grace and the willingness to live it. Forgive, Forgive our, our ignorance, ignorance, our, our self-reliance. Be, be the, the center, center of all we are. The, the light by which we walk, the blessing we bring to others, others through, through Jesus Christ, Christ alone, we ask. We ask. Amen. Amen. One of the customs that we here at Asbury have observed now for a number of years is to pause in our worship and offer a prayer for peace. Traditionally, we have thought about basically those places in our world and across the world where there is strife of a military sense. We pray and we continue to pray for those who are serving in our armed forces and we hold especially dear those who are members of our congregation and who may be in active duty at this particular point in time. But I have, my tradition when I preach here is also to hold up to us and to remind us that peace begins literally in our own hearts. Peace begins when we embrace peace, when we experience it for ourselves, when God centers our lives in and after his example, when we choose to follow him in the ways that he would have us go. So I invite you with that in mind to join me again in prayer. Dearest Lord, send your dove of peace into this world. Help us to see others, no matter how different, as brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, mothers and fathers, as family and friends in the great human adventure. We pray for your spirit in the world. Dearest Lord, send your dove of peace into your church. Guide us into the world to love and serve. Fill our hearts with mercy, understanding, and compassion for others, no matter where they are on their spiritual journey. We pray for your spirit in the world. Dearest Lord, send your dove of peace into this nation. Let all citizens bear good will towards other citizens. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Let all citizens bear good will towards other citizens, regardless of race, color, creed, national origin, age, gender, disability, marital status, or sexual orientation. We pray for your spirit in the world. Dearest Lord, send your dove of peace into the social order. Help us to hold precious to our hearts the poor, the weak, the sick, the sad, the dispossessed. Lead us in service to those who struggle to survive. We pray for your spirit in the world. Dearest Lord, send your dove of peace into the natural world. Let us treasure the air, the earth, the sea, and all who swim 
fly, walk, crawl, and grow upon it, as a precious gifts they are. Help us to remember that it is our responsibility to preserve and protect them. We pray for your spirit in the world. Dearest Lord, send your dove of peace into the lives of our families and friends, especially those in our parish prayer list. <clears throat> Be with us as we begin a new year, full of hope and lives renewed in you. We pray for your spirit in the world. Thank you, Lord. We trust that as you promised in the psalm, the Lord shall give strength to his people. The Lord shall give his people the blessing of peace. Amen. Amen. Again, we want to welcome you and particularly those of you who may not be familiar with Asbury as your church home. If you're here visiting or if you're searching for an opportunity to put down roots in a new place, we want to welcome you and there is a welcoming table back at the back of the church. We invite you to stop there and be recognized and uh, we have a special gift for you. Also, while that's fresh in our minds, others of us who are regular worships here, worship, worshipers here, excuse me, will remember that there are red pads in your pews and we invite you as the children are coming down for the children's story to uh, sign the red pads and, and be recognized as in residence with us this morning. The children, would you please come down front and join me for a, a children's story? this morning. Are you being brave down here with mommy? Yeah, thank you for coming down. Yes. I wonder if either, of, did you ever read The Grinch, How the Grinch Stole Christmas to these little people? You have? Okay. Do you, do you remember that story too? You usually watch it? Okay, yes, I know there's opportunities to read it and there are opportunities to watch it on television, but what, did, what happened in the Grinch, when the Grinch stole Christmas? Um, he was jealous about Christmas because his heart was too small. His heart was too small, that's precisely right. He didn't like Christmas because he didn't have a very big heart. And what did he do anyway? Tiny, tiny, what, what, did, he, what did the Grinch do? He stole it. He stole it. He went down into Hoosville and he stole the all the food and the Christmas presents and the decorations and and the trees and everything else that was really a really a grinchy kind of thing to do wasn't it yeah that wasn't very nice well yeah that made everybody in Hoosville you thought probably they would be kind of sad about that wouldn't you yeah well it didn't turn out that way at all did it no what the the people at Hoosville knew that Christmas wasn't just about things, was it? No, they had to have, make an adjustment to change to how they celebrated Christmas because of what the Grinch was doing. But they knew that they, were, they could still be happy and that they could still have a good Christmas because they had love in their hearts. His, and because they, they didn't, yes, his heart grew bigger, that's right. Well, I want to tell you a story this morning about another Grinch. One that we don't often think about, but he obviously was a Grinch and he lived a very long time ago and he tried to spoil the very first Christmas. Wow, I know. He tried to spoil Jesus' birthday and the day that Jesus was born. You know what? He was a king. His name was Herod and he didn't have a very big heart either. He was worried, someone had told him that the baby Jesus was going to be a king. 
And so he thought that that meant that he might be wanting to take away his throne. So a long time ago, you know, up in the manger scene here this morning, we have some people, see that fellow there on the, on the left, right in front with the yellow robe on? What, you know what he is? What? He is a king, or a, actually a wise man, I'm sorry. And there are three of them right up there on the front, and they brought their camels, that's how they got to visit the baby Jesus. And they bring in frankincense. They, they bring in frankincense and myrrh and gold to him, yep. Well, when Herod learned that they had been to visit the baby Jesus, he called them to come and see him because he said he wanted to go and, and worship the baby Jesus too. You mean angel? Well, there are angels in the story too. But in this case, you know, the, the, uh, the angel came and, and told those, the wise men not to come back and tell Herod where the baby was because you know what really Herod wanted to do? What? He wanted to kill the baby Jesus because he, was, he didn't have, he was, he was a jealous kind of guy like, like the Grinch. He, wanted to, he didn't want the baby Jesus to grow up. And so he, because he was afraid he would take away his, his throne and, and try to be the king instead of him. So the, the, the angels came and helped the wise men and told them not to tell Herod. And the angels came and told Mary and Joseph to take the baby and go away and hide so that he would be protected. And so the Grinch at Jesus' time didn't work either. And Jesus grew up to be a very important person, didn't he? He grew up to be our savior. But way back in Jesus' time, there were people who were like the Grinch, yeah. who didn't have a big heart and wanted, wanted things to be different and yeah. wanted to try to, to hurt people. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So what we have to remember is that our job is that we have to grow up and remember to tell people the story about Jesus because he was a very special person, wasn't he? He loves us, he cares for us, and he wants everybody to know that he loves them too. Okay, can you remember when, as you grow up, you can tell, even now you can tell people that Jesus loves them, okay? All righty. Shall we just bow for a quick prayer? Okay, all right, can we bow our heads? Thank you, God, for this, this time together for this time for stories and for these special people. For these little girls whose lives have been blessed by the time that they can come and be in church and learn about you and learn to love you and to learn to know that you love them. Bless them and keep them. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Our scripture today can be found in your pew Bible on page 836. It is Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. And um, at the beginning of this chapter, it talks about the wise men coming and so forth. And this chapter 13 picks up um, just after they had left. Okay. Just after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt. 
and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And the prophet had said, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Unquote. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah, who had said, A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. He had killed them. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said to Joseph, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who were seeking the child's life are dead. So Joseph then got up, he took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. After being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth. So what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. And what they had prophesied was, that he will be called a Nazarene. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. <clears throat> will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, as we gather this morning, open our hearts and our minds that we may hear the word that you proclaim for us today. Difficult as these words and these stories may be, Help us to make the connections in our hearts and in our minds that will lead us forth from this place to be better prepared to love and serve you. May the words then of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your, our, in your sight, O Lord, our, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Before I begin the formal part of my message this morning, one of the things that I often experience and sometimes remark about in my life are those unexpected moments when God is trying to reach out and touch you and in some way communicate with you in a special way. I was sitting in my easy chair in my living room the other evening and uh, my wife is usually in charge of selecting the kinds of things that we watch and sometimes pre-records them and plays them back. Well, I started out listening to this PBS broadcast that Murdy had recorded and was playing and uh, was very prepared to become especially bored with it. it. Didn't sound particularly interesting. It didn't sound anything like anything I would have particularly, could have caught my attention while I was surveying the menus, the way in which you can choose those things you want to record and play back later. Well, um, again, and I'm sure you'll see this reflected in my message this morning. I was both surprised, I was moved, I was a bit astonished. You see, you hear those recollections over time about history repeating itself, and one of the things that you and I may come to have a greater awareness of this morning is the fact that it does. In fact, the stories that were being 
reported on, on that PBS presentation were about refugees. People who were leaving the home and security that they had known for, in cases, many years. These were, in this case, mostly adults, but children were, uh, were players in this story as well. It was people fleeing from countries in not just one, but several, Africa, Syria, Lebanon, places of all over the, all over the world. People whose lives had been threatened in some significant way, who had suffered persecution, whose lives were in danger, no matter what their age, no matter what their ethnic background, no matter what their religious beliefs. These were people who were having to flee their country because the political systems in place in their immediate vicinity were a threat to them and to their well-being. Remember that as you listen to this morning's story, as you listen to the story of Jesus and Joseph and Mary experiencing that very thing in their lives when they had to flee for their lives because of the political system in place in their country way back 2,000 years ago. So this morning as we begin the new year, we begin to focus again, as most of us have, on the day-to-day -day experiences of our lives. Most of us have spent the past 40 plus days building up to the crescendo of Christmas and then the letdown that happens as the holidays Excuse me. As the holidays come to a conclusion, and and you and I have to get back to the to the day-to-day -day activities that we've pursued for so long, the anticipation has been all about hope. The emphasis has been on joy and celebration. But we just heard a story about a guy by the name of Herod who desperately tried to throw a monkey wrench into the the joy of it all who tried, frankly, to kill off the very reason we've been doing all this celebrating. Funny, isn't it, how we try very hard to ignore this one when it came time to pick this particular passage of Scripture from the lectionaries, there were two options. One was the option that I've chosen, and the other was the parable of the sheep and the goats. Even the lectionary gives you an option to forget about the hard stuff, to forget about the difficult message that's right there alongside the joyful ones. Funny, isn't it? You know, is it not this story of all the nativity stories that most clearly connects the birth of Jesus with one of the burning issues of our own day? A generation of children stolen from their families on the say-so of the government of the day. Refugees flying violent repression and seeking asylum in other countries. Governments employing massive violence to achieve political ends, killing large numbers of people and explaining away civilian deaths as justifiable collateral damage. It all sounds eerily current, doesn't it? Some historians reckon that Jesus and his family would have had to make at least a part of their trip into Egypt by sea. And so you can even picture the refugee boat people as well, those coming from Cuba to the United States. Not only is this a story that makes the strongest connections between the nativity and the harsh realities of our world, it is also a story that most clearly relates to the birth of Jesus and to the bigger themes of his mission in the world. It is, is, you could say, the story that connects the Christmas faith directly with the Easter faith. There's little question that Matthew was quite deliberate in drawing these connections, but it's also true that he did so in ways that are not necessarily so obvious to us as they may have been to the first hearers of these accounts. A congregation who were deeply steeped in the traditions and stories of ancient Israel 
For rather than draw the lines directly from Christmas to Easter, Matthew links the birth stories to some of the most important ancient Jewish stories, stories which clearly early Christians were more used to than we are, drawing on them to illustrate the saving significance of Easter events. The stories tap straight into the most treasured and identifying stories of the Hebrew folklore. Every Jewish family recites a, and partially reenacts the stories of the escape into Egypt from the, uh, each year at Passover. It is more familiar to them than the Christmas stories are to us. Every Hebrew child grows up with stories of Moses floating in the bulrushes to avoid the slaughter of infants and of the grown-up Moses coming out of hiding after the death of Pharaoh who sought to kill him. Matthew's readers and listeners were not going to miss this blatant cross-referencing to stories that, center, that are at the central part of the liberation of God's people. Jesus, Matthew is saying, is God's chosen agent of liberation, just as Moses was. And there was no doubt that the people were looking for another liberator. For more than 400 years, Israel had been under the thumb of foreign powers, first the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, and then the Persians, and then the Greeks, and back in that particular time, the Romans. So any story about a baby born in the line of David in the city of David, who somehow escapes the slaughter of every male Hebrew child under the age of two, who is hidden till the death of a vengeful king and who symbolically comes out of Egypt into the promised land, is a story that's going to quickly capture the imagination of those people who hear it. And so it is in this context that Matthew's message is the real message of hope, loaded with signs of promise. It is a message of real good news for real oppressed people. God is acting in human history again, just, in the just as in the time of Moses. God has heard the cries of the suffering and has seen the injustice that his people are being subjected to and has anointed a liberator to cast off the yoke of oppression and to lead them to freedom. And as Matthew will tell us later, unlike Moses, this liberator will be with us forever. Matthew's stories start with the promise of Emmanuel, God is with us, and closes 28 chapters later with a promise, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. So this act of liberation is not an event that was completed in one in one place, in one lifetime. This action of liberation may have begun with a baby in Bethlehem, but it is to be continued by all those who would bear the name of Christ in every place where there is suffering, distress, injustice, poverty and despair and oppression. Now while we see here Matthew drawing connections between these ancient liberation stories and the Christian stories, we are much more familiar with drawing connections to the events of Jesus' death and resurrection. We make connections between the Passover and the Last Supper. We make connections between the waters of baptism and the crossing of the Red Sea. We speak of Jesus passing through the deep waters of death to lead, that lead from slavery into the promised land of God's resurrection life. So it is by connecting the birth stories to those stories that Matthew illustrates the significance of the birth of Jesus for a faith centered on the stories of his death and his resurrection. And in the process, he illuminates for us how we not only meaningfully call to memory the stories of both ends of Christ's life, but we also call to mind the prayer to those who have lost homes or families or freedoms, to the violence of our world's power. And as we weave all these stories together, we encounter again Christ, who hears the cries of all who suffer, comes to lead us out of fear and slavery and into the wide open spaces of God's love, and promises to be with us always, even to the end of the age. You and I, my friends, have the benefit of hindsight. We're looking back at a story whose beginning and ending are very familiar to us. 
Today we are called again to examine the continuation of this saga that's taking place even now, even as we worship this morning, even in our own world. Do any of those events strike your heart as they do mine? Do any of these figures of our time remind you of any in the birth stories? Do any of these places, yes, very close to the birthplace in many cases of Jesus, come to mind as you hear these stories this morning? My challenge to you today is to listen carefully and be watchful. The events you hear on the news ought to have a familiar ring. What kind of response can we expect from God? Can we learn anything from our previous experiences? What kind of response does God expect from you and me? I wish I could play back the reality of those stories. Those stories told by those persons recorded in that television program. You watched as they desperately tried and often became frustrated in their effort to survive and help their families survive. There was fear, yes, and there was death, and there was destruction all around. But woven in were loving hearts people who reached out to welcome, to encourage, to support the suffering, those whose lives had been traumatized by the experiences of war and rumors of war. We have the opportunity to make a difference, even here, even now. May it be so. Amen. Our hymn, O Sing a Song of Bethlehem, it's number 179 in your hymnals.
<laughs> my wife encourages me when I sing to turn off the microphone, so that's why I'm fussing with it now. <laughs> She's the only one who can get away with that. You know? <clears throat> I do sing very loudly, but <clears throat> obviously some people think I sing off key. <laughs> anyway, this morning we have the blessing of being able to worship together. We are a community of faith and we have the opportunity to share our burdens and our joys at this particular point in time. We do just that. Recognizing that when we share the, our burdens can be lightened and, and our joys can be multiplied and we need both of those things. We don't, I'm, I'm a chaplain in a hospital and I uh, frequently remind people that the journey they're making does not have to be taken alone. It's an, a, a journey accompanied by our loved ones and our friends and most important, of course, by God. So, are there joys and concerns that you would like to lift up this morning? Our ushers are prepared to uh, bring you a microphone. And be brave, you'll be surprised once this gets rolling. I totally agree with Toby. Um, this morning I got up and I said, wow, this is a new year, but you know what? I'm going to do this journey with God first and the people around me, friends and family. So thank you, Toby. Thank you, family, friends, church, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Other joys and concerns. Toby, uh, Ellie's due to have uh, surgery on Tuesday morning to take that kidney stone out. Kidney stones are miserable, painful kinds of things. Some of the people here this morning realize that she's been through a great deal in this past year and that she's been recovering at uh, Samaritan Keep and getting some uh, rehabilitation. Right. And uh, now another challenge has come into her life. So yes, we need to pray for Ellie. Yes. I would like prayer for my nephew in West Virginia, Laramie Davis, who's in a real mess right now. I have a joy. Micah Edwards is home safe. He's a, a great patriot, a great friend, and we're, we're just glad that he's here. Is he in the military? Yes, he's right here. Yes. Bob? Concern. The residents of Brawley, California, last night around 1030, experienced over 100 earthquakes oh my in, God. in the course of two hours. Oh. Uh, I'm not going to keep going on about Nicaragua. We will learn a lot, a lot. Meredith will be sharing a lot. Um, one of her experiences that we will learn about is the orphanages. There were over 30 children in this one orphanage. Um, so it does impact their lives still, even with the modernization that we experience. Uh, people are not so lucky. So I think we'll be keeping them in our prayers for a while. Other joys and concerns. We uh, in our family have been enjoying family times as well. Uh, you will probably see following around uh, after church this morning at the coffee hour and so forth, the three little girls who are not necessarily familiar to most of you, but we're very familiar to grandpa and grandma. <laughs> and we uh, celebrated New Year's in a rather non-traditional way, um, we, we had a New Year's Eve party attended by grandpa and grandma and three little girls between the age of two and seven. <laughs> and uh, we had a grand time, so I hope that each of you as well enjoyed the uh, celebration and anticipation of a new year in your lives and the opportunities and, and challenges as well that are brought to us. But again, remembering we don't journey alone. Any other joys or concerns? 
Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Gracious and loving God, in the, mere, in the midst of a world that is troubled, we lift our hearts in prayer to you. We shout out the joys of safe journeys home for our military families, for loved ones that visit us and enrich our lives, for the church family that stands alongside us in times of both joy and in times of need. We hold up the names of those that we have called this morning, the lives touched by challenging illnesses, by difficulties known and unknown, by life that seems sometimes overwhelming and difficult to see as a place of, of joy and peace. We ask that you would bless each one named and those that are held personally in our own hearts and minds, and not only those on our prayer lists, but also those that we just simply know personally and pray for regularly. Wherever illness or danger or fear or suffering holds the lives of those we know, we pray for your freeing love and grace and peace. We joyfully worship the Spirit born at this season and we know that gift that comes from loving and serving you. Help us, Lord, to be challenged by the opportunities that we have to reach out to those around us both in our communities and around the world. We know that suffering and pain and death still abound and hearts that are motivated by selfishness and greed and fear and anger. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to help us to be instruments of your peace. We pray, Lord, for this church and its journey forward. Help us to see clearly the path that you have for us. We ask that you will continue to bless those minds discerning its way. We ask that you will continue to be a light to us. As we hold dear the time that we have spent, help us to share the the good news as we continue working and worshiping and loving together. We ask these and all things that are in our hearts and on our minds, Lord, in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray and say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God has dealt graciously with us. He has given us many gifts and we have now the opportunity to share some of the gifts of our hands for the work of our church. The ushers will wait upon us for our morning offering.
Please join me now in the unison prayer printed in your bulletins. Dear Lord God, we give you thanks for all that you've accomplished at the time of Jesus' birth. We thank you for the life you gave him and through him for the life that you even give us now. And did the wise men, so do we. We offer gifts to him for his work, for his life in the world today. Bless this and what we offer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 577, God of Grace and God of Glory. Will you join me in the commissioning? In the power of the Holy Spirit, we now go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ. Go in peace, and may the joy of Mary upon seeing her newborn son be in your hearts. May God fill you with his spirit and speak to you innermost being, guiding you in the way you should go. May the love of Christ surround you and shine forth from you, both now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated.
God has called us here. And now he sends us forth. Go tell it on a mountain that Jesus Christ is born. And by the way, on your way out, please stop and join us for a time of some refreshment and fellowship. Happy New Year. May the blessings of God, Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and always. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Vina. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you, sir. That was wonderful. Thank you. Wendy wants to pick up the points. Thank you. This has been a broadcast of the 1015 service, Sunday morning, from Asbury United Methodist Church, located on Franklin Street in Watertown, Asbury United Methodist Church.